A wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. I am bound to the helmet and use a human host. But that, that is, is not, not your way. way. You're family, Nabu! Am I? That wizard came from the moon. Some classes are just phenomenally useful to have in a party, and wizard is one of them. If you're lucky enough to have a competent wizard as an adventuring companion, your party can accomplish truly amazing things. The wizard is, without a doubt, one of the best utility casters. And if you know how to prepare properly, there's almost nothing you can't handle. Now, like any pure arcane casting class, the wizard has some substantial frailties. First off, they have the lowest BAB and only a D6 hit die. So you're probably not going to be hitting anything in melee unless it's like an ooze or something. And even then... to be sinking some feats into arcane armor training, and we're not going to go there right at this moment. So, first let's look at skills. Wizards have some valuable skills. First off, they have appraise. It's always good to know what exactly an item is and what it sells for. They have craft. Wizards are natural crafters. They are probably the best class for making magic items. Wizards get all of the knowledges. And that is definitely core to your ability to foresee and plan ahead for what the party is going to encounter. As a wizard, it's your job to be making the knowledge checks. Has your party been told about some old spooky ruins? Well, why don't you make a knowledge history or a knowledge dungeoneering to see what might be there? Have you been sent to clear out some goblins in an old fort off in the woods? Well, make a knowledge geography and a knowledge nature to see the kind of hazards you'll encounter on the way so you can prepare against them. Wizards also get linguistics, and this can be very useful, especially because some of the more devious races like to hide the instructions for their magical goo in languages that most people aren't going to be able to read. And you're sure going to want to be able to read that draconic inscription that says, Do not open this box, demon inside. Wizards also receive Spellcraft as a class skill, and this is just a really good general useful skill for any spellcaster. It has numerous applications if you're creative. Alright, now let's get into the Arcane Bond. At character creation, a wizard chooses an Arcane Bond. This can take one of two forms. You can either have a Bound Object or a Familiar. If you go with the Bound Object, it must be one of the following. It must be an amulet, a ring, a staff, a wand, or a weapon. This object is always of masterwork quality. If you are trying to cast a spell without your bound object on your person or in hand, you must make a concentration check equal to 20 plus spell level. You can use your bound object once per day to cast one spell in your spell book even if you haven't prepared it ahead of time. Oh, by the way, you can't do this for a spell from one of your opposition schools. We'll get into that later. You can add additional abilities to your bound object as if you had the item creation feat necessary if you're of the right level. The example that they give in the book is a wizard with a bound weapon. Once he reaches level 5, he can add additional abilities to that weapon as if he had craft magic arms and armor. All right, now on to the familiar, and I'm just going to scratch the surface with this because it really is worthy of a video onto itself. There are so many great things you can do with a familiar craft wizard. There are feats you can use to get amazing magical creatures. You can add Eidolon evolutions. You can just go nuts, do really cool stuff. But this video is about the basics. Your familiar is a small animal, and by small I don't mean small size category, it's just not very big. 
For any effect related to hit die that hits your familiar, think sleep. Treat its hit die as if they were equal to its master's character level. Your familiar has HP equal to half of its master's HP total, rounded down. When it attacks, it uses your base attack bonus, and its strength modifier or dex modifier, whichever is higher, to determine its ability to hit in melee combat. Familiars also get a whole bunch of additional neat abilities. They get increasing natural armor bonuses, they get substantial increases to their intelligence score until it's going to be smarter than the fighter, although that's not hard. They get spell resistance, and just a lot of really cool stuff. Now let's get into the school specialization. The wizard's arcane schools behave in a lot of ways like cleric domains. Depending on which school you choose to specialize in, you'll receive a nifty passive ability. As an example, if you go with a transmutation specialist, you'll receive a plus one enhancement bonus, plus one for every five levels that you have, to one of your physical ability scores, that's strength, dexterity, or constitution. And you can change this to a new ability score whenever you prepare spells. You'll also receive an activated ability. This is typically an ability usable a number of times per day, typically equal to 3 plus your intelligence modifier. As an example, an evocation-focused wizard can fire a number of force missiles that deal 1d4 points of damage plus bonus damage from his passive ability. These little missiles are really great because they're made of force and you can use them on things that have lots of resistances, or can just say no to physical damage, like ghosts. Finally, as you increase in level, you'll receive a higher level activated ability. As an example, at 8th level, a Conjuration-focused wizard gets an ability called Dimensional Step. This allows you to teleport 30 feet per wizard level. You have to use this new special form of movement in 5-foot increments, and activating it is a standard action. However, as you know, magic comes at a price. And the price for school specialization is you must take two opposition schools. In order to cast a spell from your opposition school, you have to sacrifice two spell slots. And if you're attempting to craft a magical item that has a spell requirement from your opposition school, you take a negative four penalty on your roll. You will, however, receive one bonus spell slot per spell level to prepare spells from your specialized school. Now, if you want to avoid this school specialization mess entirely, you can just go Universalist, and there's nothing wrong with that. You don't get any of the extra spell slots, but you also don't have to worry about the opposition schools. Alright, now let's talk about the feature which gives the wizard such amazing versatility. That's the fact that they prepare spells instead of having spells known, like sorcerers or bards. A wizard can know any number of spells. He can know all of the spells in the entire core rulebook, as long as he has them written down in his spellbook. So, if you're playing a wizard, you can take crazy situational spells. And spells that are just fun, like Tiny Hut. You know you want a Tiny Hut. At the start of each adventuring day, a wizard has to spend an hour preparing spells out of his book. Oh, and FYI, you're probably going to want to keep a copy of your spellbook somewhere safe, because sneaky or mean DMs might try and take or damage that spellbook, and you really don't want that. Next, wizards receive Scribe Scroll as a bonus feat. This is really important, because wizards don't have that many spell slots per day. So keeping spells in the form of scrolls is a great way to have access to things that you might otherwise not have enough spell slots to prepare. Wizards also receive a number of bonus feats that they can spend on metamagic feats, item creation feats, or spell mastery. Okay, now I want to give you just some tips and general details about the wizard class. Wizards have the fastest spell level progression. They get a new spell level basically every third character level. So you're going to be getting access to things like Fireball and Lightning Bolt and all that cool guy stuff before the Sorcerer does. Now granted, once he gets it, he's going to have more of them, but if you scribe enough scrolls, you'll have that covered. 
Gold is actually really important to the wizard because of things like the cost of scribing scrolls, because you really don't want to run out of those useful spells. Like Fireball is a really good example. Let's just say you're in the middle of a fight, you throw your one prepared Fireball out there, and you're rolling like twos and threes and ones on your damage die and everyone makes their reflex save and that just sucks and you've basically blown your prepared spell that's why the forethought of preparing scrolls ahead of time for things that you know you're going to need is really important finally when you sit down and create your wizard you really only need to have one ability score in mind and that's intelligence Any race that gets a bonus to intelligence is automatically going to be good for the wizard. So that's things like Elf or Sylph, uh, Tiefling, that's another good one. Beyond that, you really have a lot of flexibility when creating a wizard. You could have a wizard with a high strength modifier and you've got a big weapon. If you're willing to try and get the weapon and armor proficiencies, you can have a very dexterous wizard and be really good at those uh, ranged touch attacks. You can have a wizard who's really charismatic. You have the roles to spend after intelligence. Thank you for watching the D6 Damage Wizard Class Analysis. If you're interested in more strategy and character build videos for Pathfinder or Dungeons & Dragons, check us out right here on YouTube. Thank you for watching.